Hello and welcome to the 2023 Grad Futures Forum Graduate Student Professional Development Conference hosted by the Graduate School at Princeton University. My name is Eva Kubu and I'm the Associate Dean for Professional Development and Director of Grad Futures. We're delighted you could join us for the fourth year of this annual conference designed to support graduate students' futures at Princeton and beyond. Since the launch of Grad Futures in fall of 2019, the Graduate School has continued to expand its commitment to professional development. Grad Futures now serves as Princeton's hub for empowering graduate student futures through a broad spectrum of skills training, mentorship, bespoke experiential opportunities, and interdisciplinary exploration. We created this annual conference to both advance the professional development of our own graduate students and serve graduate communities beyond Princeton. Each year, registrations continue to pour in from across the country and around the globe, a testament to the imperative of investing in comprehensive professional development to empower the next generation of scholars, researchers, entrepreneurs, and leaders. Many thanks to my amazing Grad Futures colleagues, James Van Wyck, Sonali Majumdar, and Amanda Peacock, our graduate student professional development associates, Soraya Jones, Rose Gindrick, and Shannon Hoffman. Dean Rodney Priestley of the Graduate School, our dedicated graduate alumni partners, campus partners, and our many expert speakers and industry partners, without whom this conference would not be possible. Over the course of the next six days of the conference, there will be more than 21 unique sessions and 40 speakers and panelists, all focused on supporting graduate student futures through programs that prepare them with the clarity, competencies, connections, and most of all confidence we know they need now and in the future. The theme of this year's Grad Futures Forum is advancing innovation, equity, and inclusion via professional development. I've invited two experts to be in conversation with me today to kick off the conference by sharing their thoughts on these very important topics. Leonard Casuto, Julia Freeland Fisher, and I will discuss innovations that can help expand students' networks and increase access to opportunities. Lenny Casuto is a professor, professor of English at Fordham University and the author of several books, including his most recent book, The New PhD, How to Build a Better Graduate Education, co-authored with Robert Weisbach. Lenny is also a columnist for the Chronicle of Higher Education, who's earned the moniker America's Graduate Advisor. As a longtime advocate for student-centric approaches to graduate student success, in recognition of his pioneering work in modeling and promoting graduate student professional development at the local and national levels, he received Princeton's inaugural Gratitude Award for the advancement of graduate student professional development in December of 2022. Julia Freeland Fisher is a graduate of Princeton undergraduate class of 2007. She is the director of education research at the Clayton Christensen Institute and the author of the book, Who You Know, Unlocking Innovations That Expand Students' Networks that focuses on ways to enhance students' access to and ability to navigate new peer, mentor, and professional networks. Welcome, Lenny and Julia. Thanks, Eva. Glad to be here. Thank you both for joining us. Really, the Graduate School at Princeton and many, many other institutions, uh, we're all realizing the interconnection of our pri priorities around increasing access to graduate education and making sure that we offer comprehensive professional development as a means to ensure equitable access to opportunity. At the heart of this, of course, are innovation and inclusion. So let, let's start there. Lenny, in your new book, you've documented what you call the growing movement for a student-centered, career-diverse graduate education. With an increasingly diverse graduate student population, can you share one or two examples of innovative approaches that you're seeing in graduate education that truly center students' diverse educational and professional interests, needs, and challenges? Certainly, Eva. Uh, before I begin, 
uh, I want to thank you for this invitation and uh, and also commend you and all and everyone involved. This is a wonderful event, and I'm grateful to be included in it again. Uh, so um, the the question the question you're asking, uh, I will get to the examples, but I want to start a little bit higher in the air to talk about what a challenge this is, because it really is a cultural challenge. The cult the culture of graduate school is traditionally and historically not designed to serve students. It's designed to serve faculty, that uh, faculty give courses in their research, science, scientists run labs around their research, graduate students are simply expected to fit into the, those frameworks, which they do quite adeptly because graduate students tend to be very adept. But uh, in, in these times, I'm not, well, actually, I'm not sure that model was ever particularly tenable, but in these times, it's really not. It's very important that we think about organizing graduate school from the student's point of view, which really does involve a shift in culture. And shifting culture is not, never has been easy. So when we're talking about any given example on the ground that works, and, I, and as I said, I promise I'll get to them in a, few, in a couple of minutes, the uh, any given example on the ground is only going to work if it's part of some kind of concerted move to change culture. And the uh, and any uh, any institution that has managed to do that really deserves our special attention because those examples, while becoming more common, are not in any way uh, the uh, uh, a majority or close to it. We, there's still we still have a lot of work to do, and part of an example of what of what we need to move off of is the idea of the single advisor ad advising the single student that that's that's the uh, the the center of the graduate school model where you have uh, a a, men a mentorship relationship that is a closed cell where the graduate student is working directly with the faculty advisor and anybody else involved who may be in the department in uh, in the program in the graduate school, anywhere else in the university, those people are relegated to secondary importance, if if that. So collaborative advising is not only a metaphor, it's a practice that we need to think about putting it, make making more widespread. Collaborative advising would in, entails a culture change from the idea of the single advisor, even moving beyond the committee, because the committee is uh, in, in, in implies that it's only people from the department. Graduate students need to be able to get advice from everywhere in the university and outside it, and their departments and programs need to be able to honor that. And now, I and if that if those things happen, that is, if we can promote a student-centered graduate education of this sort. It allows for the kinds of socially committed research, socially committed public facing research that can create not uh, not only a, a, a diverse, diverse educational and professional interests, but also the other kind of diversity, the uh, the diversity um, uh, where members of underrepresented groups who care very much about gate about connecting their research to their communities, graduate school will become more welcoming for those populations and it will look more like America, which is another, another very important goal. All that having been said, I will flag uh, a, uh, an example from the University of Louisville because I think it, it, it reflects what it is that I'm talking about here. Louis Louisville has uh, a, um, a series of 20 to 30 workshops that it, uh, that it runs every year. The workshops go under a broad rubric that they that uh, that has the the acronymic name Plan, where the P in Plan stands for professional development, the L for um, for life skills. I may not have exactly the um, the names the names perfectly correct. A is for academic development, and N is for networking. Mm -hmm. And um, the and I think that. Um, the networking deserves some particular attention in light of where of, of um, our conversation today. But uh, at Louisville, these workshops go on uh, every semester and they're taught by graduate students, administrators, and faculty on a volunteer basis. It's co-curricular 
which is second best. We would like these things to be curricular, but it is a culture. It's a culture uh, for graduates, uh, by graduate students, for graduate students, that is fostered and maintained by the administration, and it gives them all kinds of of helpful support in all of these different areas. So, a, a graduate student who's looking to turn a uh, CV into a resume can take a workshop in it. Uh, a graduate student who is uh, who wants to learn how to use LinkedIn can take a workshop in it. At the same time, a graduate student who wants to learn how to do a literature review for their dissertation can take a workshop in it. So it's a, a whole variety of offerings that are uh, that are out there every single semester. And uh, it's part of what it means to go to graduate school at Louisville. It is its own network of offerings, but it is um, something that points to the need for networking. Mm -hmm. that, that's a terrific example. And I also love that you, you know, pointed out it's co-curricular and that you know, the best situation might be for it to be curricular. And, and how, how might we think about making professional de development intrinsic in terms of the curriculum? Well, all, all departments and programs, if they are going to think about graduate education from the point of view of graduate students, need to reckon on the reality that those students are going to face when they're finished, if they finish their graduate program. Those realities are obviously going to vary. A, um, uh, a student in economics is looking at a different professional landscape than a student in anthropology, let's say. But uh, the, uh, the department or program knows the most about the culture and history of its own discipline. And one possible move that departments and programs can make is to institute a credit-bearing professional development seminar for first-year students to take whose goal is to introduce those first-year students to the culture of the discipline broadly conceived, which means not only, of course, the, uh, the different branches of content within the discipline, but also the role that the discipline plays, not only within the arts and sciences, but within society at large. So uh, the te teacher of such a seminar could consider bringing in uh, people who are practicing in the uh, in in different professions, using the training that they've received in all manner of different ways. That's just one example, but mm -hmm. the, uh, the idea is to bring these imperatives into the curriculum without diminishing the content of the discipline, but rather showing students what that content can with the different uses that that content can be put to. That is a way of ensuring the continuing uh, survival and thriving of the discipline, not in in this in the context of the university and also in the context of the of society at large. Thank you, and and Julia, I, you know, on the topic of networks uh, and 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 also ways that we can think about building these networks through graduate education, your research has focused on creating webs of support for students. As an alumna of Princeton, you know that multi generational alumni networks have existed for decades for Princeton undergraduates. In pre preparation for our talk today, you and I talked a little bit about Princeton graduate students and how Grad Futures has made a concerted effort to engage graduate alumni uh, in our efforts. As we focus on equitable access to opportunities, what should we consider with respect to social capital building with first generation, low income, or even our international graduate students who may not have a professional network that pre-exists prior to coming to graduate school. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Eva. I mean, I think there's a <clears throat> there's sort of like a bigger philosophical statement to start off with, which is that because of the sort of myth of meritocracy that Americans, uniquely Americans, tend to cling to, we have bought into a narrative that you go to college and you get a job, or alternately you go to, on to grad school and you get an even better job. But the reality in the data is that credentials alone don't spell access to jobs. Um, attainment is a proxy for sort of part of the journey um, to job getting, but an estimated half of jobs and internships actually come through 
personal connections and networks, which to your point, Eva, means that a first generation college student who may have all sorts of support and other resources built into their network may not actually have access, may not have inherited the networks they need to get the jobs that they want, right? And LinkedIn puts that 50% all the way up at 80%, which that's a skewed data set, but it, it leans towards the knowledge economy. So we have this invisible currency um, and who students know is something institutions rarely track, even what Lenny just said about Louisville naming network in the end of plan, that's almost radical to even put that out there as part of the ingredients to getting a job. Um, but I think measurement and equity have to go hand in hand here until we start to measure students access to an ability to mobilize networks. We're not gonna have the real terrain of what's at what students have access to or not post-graduation. Um, and that right now there's really slim, but but kind of troubling data on what that looks like. Um, Brookings has done some studies of adult job seekers um, and what their networks look like across four American cities. Race and gender appear to be the most salient predictors. Um, black men report the smallest, weakest networks as measured by sense of reciprocity. Women generally across race and ethnicity report smaller ne networks than their male counterparts. Um, so we know that, that something is afoot here in terms of unequal access. We also know from Strata, a um, couple things that I think are really interesting despite what you said Eva about alumni networks obviously being kind of part of the package that Princeton is selling broadly speaking alumni networks are deeply undercapitalized so nine percent of graduate of, of graduating sorry graduates from undergrad report that their alumni network was useful which is pretty staggering given that we're sort of selling students access to a network um, in the glossy pamphlets that we hand them that that number is higher among elite selective institutions but still hovers around 18 percent um, and lastly, Strata has found looking, again, this leans undergraduate, there's less data to my knowledge in the graduate space, although Lenny can school me on that. Um, there's, in the undergraduate space, Strata found that first generation students are much less likely than their continuing generation peers to have reported participating in social capital building opportunities while on campus. And that can range from alumni networking opportunities to securing internships in the course of their studies. Um, and all of that just adds up to the fact, again, that a credential is an imperfect indicator of whether or not you have gained access to the network you need to get the job you want. The last thing I'll say, Eva, on this concept of multi-generational networks, there's a lot of wisdom in the research behind that kind of concept or what, what people call sort of webs of support. It partly connects to one of Lenny's points about faculty advisors, this idea that we sort of have over-indexed on a single mentor who's going to serve myriad functions. Um, and even this idea of sort of a committee or a departmental network that's going to help you um, make progress post-graduation. The reality in, in sort of human development literature is that we need webs of support. We turn to different people based on different needs who can offer us different resources. And another thing to keep in mind, and Eva, maybe we can talk about this when we talk about technology, is that um, Small tight knit networks, which is sort of what I picture when I picture a committee, <laughs> right? Small tight knit networks actually contain redundant information. They tend to know a lot of the same people, have access to the same networks themselves. That's fine as a supportive academic sort of unit of support. It's actually a very poor resource when you want diversity of access to information and opportunities to, to have options in the job market. You actually want a widespread diverse network. Uh, beyond that kind of tightness. So um, I think there's just a huge runway for innovation in this space. Obviously, I'm biased is what I've been looking at for like seven years, but um, we have to start with some data on who students know, who they feel confident turning to, um, and get much more transparent about that side of the opportunity equation. So, sounds like, Julia, you know, as part of professional development efforts, you know, of course, there's lots of assessment around learning outcomes. And maybe one other aspect around that could be outcomes around connections and building of networks. Yeah, and I think there's a careful line to walk here, right? Part of the reason I think data is important is because it allows institutions to hold themselves accountable. So sometimes networking can fall into this, this category of like, well, students just need to hustle more, even though we know some students, for example, first generation students have 
access to fewer connections to begin with. So just telling them to hustle more is not actually opening the doors and being an active broker to new networks that might otherwise be out of reach. So I think being really careful that the data is not just seen as a student level outcome, but a student level indicator of where the institution needs to be more purposefully opening doors, brokering networks and access to well-resourced conversations that again, might not be arriving through students inherited networks um, as compared to their continuing generation peers, if that makes sense. So yes, and how are institutions looking at that data and not just thinking of it as an individual asset or deficit. Yeah, yeah, and being very intentional around program design, you know, and, and the way we're enhancing sort of a more systemic view on how we exactly networks. Right. And I'll just just to double click on that for a sec, we're doing some implementation support more in the high school space right now, but we're we've supported some colleges in this as well. And I think education institutions are really good about talking about delivering knowledge and skills like that's where your head goes when you're like, this is how we serve students. Um, it's a little bit of a mindset shift to say our role is also to be a broker. So we're not just sort of encouraging students to have the ability to mobilize networks, we're actually opening access to networks. And I would just distinguish between those two things in program design. People tend to sort of say they're doing both, but do a lot more of like, quote unquote, teaching students how to network without actually opening doors to new relationships, otherwise out of reach. Yeah. Do, Julia, could you could you also touch on it? I think there's also something to, you know, every time we, we speak with graduate students about networking or networks, there's just this sort of inauthentic feel to the term networking. And it seems very transactional. It feels very transactional. Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, it, it, how, how do we reframe this and actually build a system where authentic human relationships actually are forming versus these transactional? Totally. I mean, I think this is, Lenny was starting to allude to sort of either credit bearing or co-curricular experiences. I think that, um, now, so I'm like a massive introvert. I've also never attended a Princeton reunion, even though like, it seems like everyone and their mother goes and wears their jackets and everything like that. Like that type of networking, do not sign me up. I totally get the allergic reaction to it. Um, what I think colleges and graduate schools have the opportunity to be much more mindful of is how is social capital building seamlessly built into the student experience through the experiences that you're already putting within reach? So just two things that Lenny said that I think are really telling. This idea of integrating guest speakers into this like first year course, right? That is an opportunity to meet people you might otherwise never meet. By the way, you can now do it over Zoom because everyone has learned how to use Zoom in the past four years. So you suddenly are integrating relationship building and network expanding into the course of student studies versus planting it at like a reception where you have to go up to someone you've never met, right? There's a warm handoff happening vis-a-vis -vis that. The other thing that I'd say is, um, a huge opportunity where I think authenticity is actually built in because of the nature of the relationship is near peer connections. Um, so what the research is increasingly showing, some recent research from Search Institute on Education to Employment Programs really underscored this, is that near peers are sometimes the most helpful but least capitalized relationships in students' lives. And a near peer is someone who's just a few years ahead of you in age and experience, and therefore actually often has the most salient labor market information to lend you, but they're also the most relatable. It's not going up to some person you never would have met otherwise and tried to ingratiate yourself to them. It's actually talking to someone who was recently in your shoes, can relate to your experience, and can share wisdom um, sort of a few years ahead. So those could be, again, integrated into classroom work that could be part of a mentoring model. There's all sorts of ways to enlist those near peers into sort of career supports. But um, what we've heard from programs that are really doubling down on that is that there's an authenticity to that relationship because of the closeness in, in experience, um, which, which um, for the sociologists listening on this call, the phenomenon of homophily, similarity breeds connection. If you see someone you perceive to be similar to you, you're more likely to trust them, see them as a credible messenger, and again, feel sort of an authentic connection to them. Yeah, yeah, and I love that you point out that, you know, this can be baked into current mentorship models. You know, we have an alumni mentorship uh, program uh, in, in place for graduate alumni to connect with gra current graduate students, but we're also thinking about mentorship as a way, basically weaving it in 
throughout all of our programs. Um, so uh, the next question I wanted to sort of pivot and ask Lenny about was, you know, in, in again, we're intentionally thinking about mentorship as part and parcel of everything that we do, including our bespoke experiential opportunities. And I know, Lenny, in your book, uh, you and Bob talk about the value of internships and experiential fellowships. Um, and, and I think, you know, those opportunities, as, as Julia mentioned, can be really sort of enriched if there is mentorship sort of involved in that experience as well. Can you uh, maybe share a little bit in, in what you're seeing in terms of the growth of graduate student internships and experiential programs and the ex importance of these experiences, um, both for building networks, but also thinking about academic and diverse careers? So there are some good examples of graduate student internships. Again, I'll get to them in a couple of minutes they're having a hard life. And part of the reason has to do with something that Julia said, which is that um, the uh, um, uh, higher ed space is not necessarily oriented toward uh, the uh, toward measuring or even feeling responsibility for brokering these sorts of opportunities. Now, this is much, much more true on the graduate level than the undergraduate, that uh, simply the phenomenon of the undergraduate career fair shows you something, that uh, this the, un the undergraduate career fairs that, uh, that almost every college and university feels obliged to hold reflects a felt obligation on the part of the institution to provide opportunities for students to build their own networks. That is, the, the, uh, the institution has a responsibility to provide the opportunity. The student has a responsibility to take advantage of the opportunity. I don't want to overlook student responsibility here. However, nothing of the sort takes place on the graduate level with the exception of the uh, whatever remains of the vaunted old boy network by which uh, advisors would uh, get on the phone and try to get their PhD students professorships. Now, the um, the academic job market outcome, that is the tenure track assistant professorship, is uh, very much an unlikely outcome. It's improbable in almost every arts and sciences field and many of the non-arts and sciences fields along with it. So that that model is literally bankrupt. And there is nothing else on the graduate level that replaces it or supplements it. The there are no graduate student career fairs to speak of. I you know I wrote a piece about this once once calling for this, but it hasn't actually resulted in very much. And the reason for that is graduate culture isn't built to do that. The grad the graduate advisor thinks, well, I know how to get my students academic jobs. Anything else is not up to me, and I'm not going to think about it. Mm -hmm. And that is a uh, an abrogation of responsibility because it is the department or program's responsibility and with it the institution's responsibility to provide these opportunities that the student can then exert responsibility to take advantage of. And uh, we're, we see that we're seeing some of this in uh, programs such as at Princeton, but it's it's rare and at the and at the department or program level it's uh, it's very rare. All of that said, all of all of all, all of these problems mitigate against successful internship programs because the structure of graduate culture doesn't foster the development. It requires extra work to set up internship programs. It's a form of culture change. Now it's happening in certain places. The uh, and um, the and I want to add too that at state universities, it's especially difficult to set up credit bearing internships where for example not credit bearing but curricular internships where the internship would perhaps substitute for a student's teaching uh, again another obstacle before i start getting to some of some of the success stories the um, another obstacle is that in in the bench sciences students work in laboratories and the laboratory, they, they, their lab work is not only the basis of their dissertation, it's also the basis of the, the sustainability of the lab itself. The students do their work and get publications, 
the advisor and the the um, the publications lead to grants. The grants lead to publications. The students are cogs in a wheel, and the advisor is at the hub of that wheel. And that that economic economic model runs graduate school in the sciences, and it does not allow any time for graduate students in the bench sciences to do internships. Consequently, most successful internship programs in, uh, in on the graduate level have, have emanated from the humanities and social science side. Place at, at public universities where the students teaching is really important to their funding, that's another obstacle. So for example, at Iowa, which where the uh, a really well-designed um, internship program emanates from the humanities center. The internships are primarily summer internships. They've done the students enormous good, and they're they're a, a, they're particularly thoughtfully designed with a great deal of reflection and assessment that's built in, crit critical for any sort of outcomes based program, but especially for internships. At Duke, where the where the resource base is wider, the internships come uh, out of the versatile humanists program where um, the student works with uh, staff members at the at the graduate school to select opportunities for themselves and finally and this is a very important um, e exemplary aspect if a if a if a, a university is in a remote area the internships have to be provided by the university itself this is true even if the university is not in a remote area but Internships in academic administration, uh, offices like the the um, uh, offices of um, women's women and gender studies and so forth, or uh, in alumni relations, these internships are also tremendously valuable to graduate students. And uh, Lehigh University in Pennsylvania has done some really remarkable work setting up those kinds of internships. Uh, this was done on the department level by the English department, and uh, their work is, I think, um, easy to copy. And it's uh, and and the way that the program has been has been designed, it's out there. I've written about it myself. Yeah, thank you, Lenny. And yeah, it it is uh, it's it is a lot of hard work, obviously, to make sure that we're building those relationships and those partnerships with organizations that will take a, a very structured learning outcomes approach to that internship or fellowship experience. Um, and, and as I noted earlier, and provide the sort of mentorship throughout that experience that will be very valuable to the student. Um, in the nonprofit space, certainly, we are also seeing uh, for both our humanists and our social scientists, we're seeing strong demand from partners uh, that are willing to engage with us and to partner with us in this educational mission. So I, I do think this is a trend and we're, we're seeing more and more of this. The, the time aspect though, that you touch on, they have to be flexible. They have to be you know 100% willing as partners to realize that the student's academic work and research and those goals have to come first. So that that is a, a absolutely something that has to be negotiated in each and every one of these partnerships to make sure they're sort of micro internships and that the time uh, commitment is, is something that's manageable for, for the student as well. Um, Julia, just to, to pivot back to the Strata report that you mentioned that first generations, uh, first generation students are less likely to engage in internships and social capital building activities. Um, there's a plethora of new technology platforms. You touched on this very briefly um, that are available today in the ed tech space. What's your take on whether technology um, can democratize access to social capital? And how should we be thinking of this as a tool to expand equitable access to opportunities? What are some of the maybe benefits and risks associated here? Yeah, definitely. Well, Eva's being modest in how she asked this question because she's thought about this for the last two decades. Um, so you chime in, Eva, after I give my two cents. I think that you can't talk about technology without first talking about sort of mainstream social media, um, as opposed to some of the more bespoke ed tech tools that I think have a lot of potential but are much still smaller scale. So I think when we look at mainstream social media, it has its limitations. I'll date myself 
as a Facebook user, even though I like recently tried to just get it off of my phone and get, get it out of my brain. But um, the Facebook algorithm originally, right, was built to help people find people they may know, not people they should know. And, and Mark Zuckerberg has actually sort of talked about this in his reflections on how Facebook is deteriorating democracy. But um, in other words, like mainstream social media is, it's optimized around engagement and different companies have different ways of driving engagement, but it's not optimized around who are the people you need to know to accomplish your goals. That is not sort of the core business model. What it is really good at though, that um, that those of us who sort of grown up with social media now enjoy is that it's disrupting what sociologists would call the decay rates of our networks. Normally when we fall out of touch with people, those relationships decay, we can no longer enlist them when we may have a new challenge or opportunity that we're looking to, to sort of make progress in our lives. But now I not only know what my like first grade classmate had for lunch because of Facebook, Instagram, the like, but I actually can reach back out to that person in a less um, strained way than a sort of pre-technology era. So in other words, we can sort of keep on ice much larger networks than our brains can hand could have handled pre-technology. So that's like an interesting upside. Um, it's a reason why I often look at when, even when people are using tools like LinkedIn, it's sort of what's the model that you're wrapping the technology around. So if you're in, in bringing guest speakers in or having the rare Lenny career fair for, for graduate students. And they then connect with someone on LinkedIn. That means that there's actually a tool in place to kind of extend the, the half-life of that relationship, so to speak, and make it potentially something that the student could go back to um, when, if and when that relationship becomes relevant to something they're trying to accomplish out in the world. Um, so that's like one set of interesting things. Um, I'm much more interested Eva, as you alluded to, in the sort of burgeoning ed tech market around ed, that, ed tech that connects. We have too many, I'd argue, examples of technology that's just about content delivery, assessment, productivity. Far fewer technology tools premised on the ability to connect students across lines of geography or just the sheer cost of, of um, accessing people beyond their existing networks. Um, and, and I think when we talk about relationships and technology, people get squeamish, particularly on the heels of the pandemic, because none of us sort of believe that Zoom Thanksgiving is the way to be in relationship with our fellow humans, right? That was abysmal. What actually we need to be paying attention to is not digitizing those strong ties, those deep mentoring relationships, those committee experiences necessarily that are actually re really critical to getting by, but actually recognizing that technology can diversify our weak tie networks, our acquaintanceship networks, which are actually the networks through which we are more likely to find jobs. That's a finding from Mark Granovetter back in the 70s. It was confirmed by a large scale LinkedIn study late last year that um, what are called sort of our moderately weak ties, people with whom we share a few acquaintances, but not many, many, but not totally random strangers, are the people most likely to give us information and access to jobs. Um, and that is a really exciting finding for the ed tech industry. I don't think that many people are thinking about this, but there's a couple players that we've kept an eye on. Um, some are really about well-resourced career conversations. There's a company called Mentor Spaces, another one called Candor. Those are specifically geared towards students of color and young employees of color trying to navigate the job market and talk to sort of people in the know. There's also, to some of what Lenny was talking about, experiential learning and internship platforms like Parker Dewey and Ripen that are trying to make it easier, frankly, for colleges and graduate schools to stand up experiential learning and internship programs by offering those digitally. Um, and then lastly, there's a suite of tools, Mentor Collective and People Grove. I know Pitt Princeton is partnered with both of those that are really meant to help uh, institutions kind of capitalize their existing networks more efficiently. So again, back to that 9% alumni statistic, yeah. how might you use technology to enlist the remaining, um, those remaining alumni in somehow being in relationship with your current um, undergrads and graduate students. So I see a lot of potential there, but we have to not measure that in our traditional mental model of a high touch mentoring relationship as the pinnacle of every relationship a student needs. Students also need these diverse weak tie relationships that technology has a competitive advantage to forming more efficiently. Mm -hmm. So it, it's really a this and model that you know you can have those right it's not replacing yeah 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 and and I, I think you know um you and I also talked 
a little bit about our concerns in terms of just in general, when we anchor on affinity when creating social networks, we want to focus on those positive connections based on common interests and identities. But how do we avoid creating silos and built-in biases? Any thoughts on that? Totally. Yeah, I mean, I think this goes for online and offline. I think when we're looking at technology tools, they're going to accelerate more quickly, whatever kind of core principles you've designed them around, right? And so affinity groups have long been an important tool for leveling the playing field, fostering a sense of belonging, um, opening up access to networks where resources are most likely to travel efficiently because of that concept of homophily. If I, if I perceive you to be like me, I am more likely to trust you. I am therefore more likely to share resources with you. And a well-resourced network is really what we're talking about when we talk about social capital. What I think is interesting, I'll, I'll um, mentor space is one of the tools I mentioned is a great example of this. I think you can design tools with a real eye towards affinity plus if you anchor the networking or coaching or career exploration experience on the student's goals. So it comes back to Lenny's point at the beginning around being student centric. If you understand what the student's goals are, um, you could start by brokering conversations based on affinity by something like race, ethnicity, or gender, where students might feel a greater sense of confidence engaging with someone they haven't met previously. But beyond that, you can scaffold conversations with people with whom they have other shared um, interest based on their career interests, not merely on their identities. And it's a scaffolding wherein students can increasingly be talking to more people who may on paper look less like them, but may actually have deeper shared interests around their goals that you create, uh, that you don't sort of have to choose between affinity or not affinity, right? I think that's a false binary that we draw in the current climate where race, ethnicity, and gender have been sort of the only ways in which we uh, define affinity um, narrowly. Uh, and Mentor Spaces has seen actually participants on their platform who are exclusively Black and Latinx. They have seen um, a first time user will gravitate towards people who look like them. And over time, we'll start to seek out conversations, not necessarily with people who look like them, but who have the information that they are looking for. Mm -hmm. Right. And that is they think of that as a metric of confidence. We have built the students confidence to know themselves, to know their goals and to seek out again, sort of the person in the know is the phrase that the founder of Mentor Spaces, Chris Motley, would use. And sometimes that person in the know looks like you and sometimes it, that person doesn't. Um, but you're but navigating that is a matter of scaffolding, um, again, these sort of affinity plus approaches. And it's not easy to do. It sort of has to be a front end design principle. Mm. Um, either in programming or technology tools. Yeah, and I would be really curious to see sort of the date, how they're analyzing that data and, and yep. creating those models. Yep. Yeah, I mean, again, that is a fully virtual coaching model, what Chris is building mm -hmm. at Mentor Spaces. So they have the luxury, back to my point about measure, measurement and equity going hand in hand, not that I think that all relationship building is going to happen online in the future. That's a future I don't want me or my kids living in. But you do, in an online environment, have actually much more dynamic data where you can be looking at who's interacting with who, the length of that interaction. You can even start to do text recognition to understand what resources are being exchanged within those conversations. So you have the affordances of understanding a student's sort of social journey with far greater texture than when we sort what we do in analog spaces, which is like, leave a lot to chance encounter, hope that when we introduced you to someone, you actually had a well-resourced conversation, whether that happens is kind of unknown. Um, so yeah, I think not just mentor spaces, but all the tools I named um, are doing some really interesting work to actually analyze behaviors on the platform that tell us something about sort of students' networking preferences, who they're inclined to turn to, um, who's inclined to help them, et cetera. So it's not just building, you know, your network on LinkedIn so that you have, you know, 2000 plus followers. It's really sort of the depth of the conversations and those relationships that, that really matter. And I, I feel like a, a, 
I see often that students and even, you know, colleagues, you know, are, are sort of busy curating all of these connections. And it's really not about the connections, right? It's about the conversations. Yeah, exactly. Well, I, you and I talked about this offline, Eva and Lenny. Yeah. I'd be curious to hear your take on this or if you're skeptical of all the things I just said, which is totally fine. Um, the the When I first started writing about the importance of networks and like I wrote a book called Who You Know, that was because I was construing the challenge six, seven years ago as uh, really a choreography and access challenge. We have these insular institutions that we call educational institutions where you like rarely meet people at the rate that you might want to be meeting people to expand your options down the line. Now I wish I'd written a book about conversations because I actually think that's the unit of change that if we talk about relationships without talking about conversations, we can do what social media has sort of done for the past 15, 20 years, which is scale connection and maybe like not necessarily scale high quality, well-resourced conversations. That wasn't the value proposition to begin with. So that's like now a, a lens I bring to any tech tool that I'm looking at in my own research. Like what's the actual conversation that's happening on this platform? And if it's just, I'm clicking a button that says connect and no conversation happens, like let's not count that mm. in our accounting of your network. You can also, you can also train people to have conversations. Just the, in the classic, uh, the mock interview is the uh, is the classic example of that, which all graduate programs that are training people to uh, pursue academic jobs will conduct mock interviews with almost no exceptions, but they will not conduct mock interviews for non-academic jobs because they think they don't know how, but they really do, because knowing how to interact socially means knowing how to have such an interview. Mm -hmm. And um, the it's a it's a uh, an, an opportunity in the training in the training area that uh, graduates graduate schools perhaps could take greater advantage of. So, something else you said, Julia, that uh, intrigued me. The um, it's not just it's a matter of um, opportunity and capacity that uh, and the anthropologist Robin Dunbar many years ago came up with the Dunbar number. So you know about this, so, but I'll explain it. Uh, the uh, the Dunbar was British, so he conceived of it this way. Uh, how many people do you know whom you could ask to borrow five pounds? That is a, which at the time was a small, but not insignificant sum, a uh, an, an amount that you'd think, you'd think about before you gave to somebody. So how many people do you know who you could uh, call up and I'm stranded at the train station, I need to borrow five pounds. And uh, Dunbar concluded that most people have about 200 such connections and that as more people come in, others leave. That is the carrying capacity was about 200. And um, Julia, you're suggesting to me that with the advent of, so of uh, social media, techno uh, technological social media, the carrying capacity, the Dunbar number is higher, which is uh, an opportunity for anybody. Right. So Take advantage of it. Well, Mike, it's funny you say that. So my comments around decay rate drew drew directly from a Dunbar study that he did as uh, social media was scaling. It was like, well, suddenly can we handle more connections? Is that are our brains changing? He found indeed we cannot, but came to this conclusion of, but but our relationships don't decay at the same rate. So the swapping out doesn't happen. So I still could only probably think of 150 to 200 people when asked that question, but I have a digital Rolodex where I can efficiently tell a thousand people what happened yesterday in my life. And so my ability to sort of draw on a larger network is maintained, even if my brain sticks with that original number he found, if that makes sense, that's what his research showed. So I love that you brought him up. Yes. Um, I We are just at about 10 minutes to the hour. And I'm wondering if we ha might have any questions coming in from our audience. Take a look uh, here. We okay. We have one question. How do we teach folks to be good mentors for graduate students? Who would like to take that one? Uh, well, I, I certainly can. It's a, it's a it's a very broad question, but it's a good broad question. And the uh, the important thing to flag here is that there is almost no training of this sort in the graduate education sector. What there is is lore. 
that uh, people will build from their own experience. Uh, perhaps they'll try to correct bad advice they received, or they'll try to respond to to the to a good example that they may have been the recipient of. But the um, if we're going to talk about how to teach people to be good good mentors to graduate students, we need to start by sharing information, and almost none of that happens now. That is, there isn't an area of scholarship or research in how to, how to advise. It's, or I guess I should say, it's very nascent. The uh, that uh, there's there's work, for example, that uh, James Van Wyck has done, uh, but uh, there isn't enough of it, and it isn't a it doesn't have the profile that it needs to have. The way that we can learn is by sharing information, and the way that we can share information is by writing it down. Get it out, get it out of the realm of lore, get it into a shareable place. Because how do you be how to do it is going to vary from discipline to discipline, from graduate culture to graduate culture. That's part of what we need to share. Yeah. Yeah. And I I mean, I'll just add a bit to that in terms of focusing on inclusivity when in all mentorship models, that that's also something that um, you know providing training, providing resources for faculty, as well as alumni mentors and others um, to, to ensure that these relationships um, really are anchored in diversity, equity, and inclusion and best practices. Uh, we have a, a second question. Can, How can, can we... I add? Oh, oh, sure. Yes. Sorry, can I just add one quick thing here, which is just echoing this, this theme of networks. Training mentors to have the mindset that they are not the the sole answer providers but that they themselves can be brokers i think is really important and what the research has shown is that to be an effective broker meaning i am as your mentor going to introduce you to people who could help you not just be the only person who's helping you um you want to get to a level of what researchers call close connector which is you have to know enough about a student a student and their goals in order to be an effective connector or broker, you have to sort of first build trust and then pivot to what Putnam would call sort of bridging behaviors where you're connecting them to people beyond their existing network. So I think including that in training or your definition as an institution of what it means to be a mentor so that it's not just help and care being provided in a one-to-one -one capacity, but that you're actually a, a node to a whole set of other relationships. Yeah. Sorry. And, and no, no, unlocking. And, oh. I want to say knowing your students is not a given on the graduate level. There's such an assumption yeah. that we know better, that we faculty, we know what students want. We assume we know what they want and we assume we know how, how, to, how to do it for them. And that's so wrong. It's just so, so profoundly wrong that asking students what they want individually and collectively, that is surveying them, is a way that graduate that graduate pe graduate programs and their faculty the faculty members who individually staff them can learn a lot of unexpected things about their students that can enable them to teach and advise them better. Yeah, yeah. We have do we have time? We have time. One more question, I think, before we we wrap. Um, how can graduate programs, perhaps as consortia, work together? better to provide effective grad fairs to graduate students and postdocs? Or is it competition between schools that might be preventing this? Hmm. I think you're both looking at me like, do you want to take no, that? I, I'm happy to <laughs> no? answer. But Julie, <laughs> Julie, do, you want to, do you want to take a whack at it first? The, because uh, the the uh, the question is answering itself in a way that's that's pretty useful. That is the uh, if we look at what we're doing right now, the uh, uh, Princeton has organized Grad Futures, but is sharing it to anybody who wants to come on board, which is a um, not not only uh, it's it's an act of professional generosity and collegiality, but it also helps everybody because graduate culture is uh, graduate school needs all the help it can get right now. And the uh, and any work that we do that can be used by others is truly going to lift all boats. And so the uh, the notion that um, uh, that a graduate a graduate career fair is uh, something that should be kept uh, under wraps. Well, yeah, it, it's you could say that a, that a, um, a graduate school might gain a small amount 
from barring other graduate students, but the gains that come from opening the uh, the career fair up are much greater, not least because it will inform employers of the of the supply that's out there of of super qualified information specialists because that's what graduate students are and the uh, and uh, the the growing awareness that graduate students are a labor market that can be tapped in all kinds of great ways is something that we need to let more and more employers know because that will lift all boats so the idea of cons of a consortium it, uh, putting putting on a career fair, where it, particularly in a metropolitan area where there are multiple graduate schools, it's a wonderful idea. Uh, there are, of course, many ways to riff on the idea of career fairs. You, they can be done virtually, and they are being done virtually. Such few as there are, are um, they some some of them are being done that way. But uh, this really is an area where collective uh, resource pooling is going to help everybody. Yeah, yeah, and I, I would say there are also. Uh, benefits to connecting graduate students across all institutions when it comes to your research. If you're looking for someone who's doing similar research, and you might be able to now start to build a collaboration there, um, it builds your network within your discipline, perhaps, or beyond your discipline, and it also builds your base of potential collaborators and research, I think, that can really uh, take a more interdisciplinary and even inter-institution approach. Those partnerships, I think, are going to be very important moving forward. Um, we have uh, a few things to point out. I think in the, the chat, there's been, uh, of, of course, a plug for the Graduate Career Consortium. That's a, a, a consortium approach. Uh, they have a virtual career expo that's coming up that's open and collaborative. So lots, I think, Lenny, to your point, lots of progress in this, this area. Uh, we just have to make sure that we're going out and evangelizing more and more about the benefits of this. Uh, Julia, one, one question here uh, for you. It seems like in the chat, um, what kinds of systems can we put in place to get people in networks to build upon one another's successes? Yeah, just I'll just give like my 30 second answer to that giant <laughs> question. I mean, one thing that we're seeing outside of um, sort of mainstream institutions and a lot of education to employment nonprofits that are in particular serving first generation grads is a real commitment to not just sort of preaching a pay it forward um, culture, but then uh, embedding that in their organizational model. It gets back to what I was talking about around near peers. So a lot of programs that are struggling to scale have enlisted near peer recent participants and grads to part-time staff their programs. And you get all the benefits of near peers that I talked about before, but you also get a very um, visible and apparent pay it forward culture because current participants or in your case the students are seeing um, people who came just a few years before them supporting them and they suddenly see themselves as playing that role that sort of engaging in that reciprocal behavior um, soon after they graduate. It's a really powerful, I don't think I'm giving it a very inspirational view, but if you guys are interested, check out Co-op Careers, um, mm -hmm. which is a program that has scaled 30 to 50% year over year by enlisting one in 10 recent grads to serve as a near peer paid coach. And really nailed this pay it forward culture. And it means that they're building a really diverse new network of students who are helping one another once they break into the job market, navigate that job market. And it's um, probably the model I'm most excited about that I think institutions of higher ed could borrow from. Well, I, I think Julia, you've provided us with sort of the perfect theme on which to end, paying it forward. Uh, it's a very, very important concept here. I, I do want to thank Lenny Casuto and Julia Freeland Fisher for joining us today to help kick off the full week of the Grad Futures Forum and really helping us to really uh, think about more intently how we advance 
equity and inclusion and innovation in graduate education with professional development. You've both provided us with lots of thought provoking ideas and inspiration. Uh, we thank you very, very much, folks. Uh, this is the end of our kickoff, but the full week uh, remains ahead with 21 more sessions. Uh, we encourage you to visit gradfutures.princeton.edu backslash forum to view the full schedule and register for additional online sessions. Tomorrow, uh, on Tuesday, at noontime, we will offer a session on essentials of startup funding. Uh, so speaking of innovation, innovation and entrepreneurship, uh, we'll go take a deep dive uh, with two alums uh, who will give us a walkthrough uh, and their expertise, expertise on venture capital. Uh, so do join us tomorrow afternoon. And thank you again, Lenny and Julia.